Hi, my name is Mike Gaiman, and welcome to episode 18 of my KSP campaign. If you are a fan of senseless crashes, hitting surfaces of bodies when you weren't meaning to, just due to the ineptitude of design and piloting, well then the first part of this video is going to be a treat for you because you're going to see three of these things in a row. The first two involve the debris, the ascent stages, left behind by ComSat 3 and ComSat 4. Four, which were both put into orbit uh, during last episode. And what I'm going to do now is I want to deorbit the debris. Both of these have armed parachutes on them, so I'm hoping to recover the debris. So I've selected ComSat 4, and I'm just time warping to the point where I feel that the periapsis is in a position that I think this thing will come down pretty close to the Kerbal Space Center, and I want it close, of course, because that maximizes the recovery cost. So all I have to do now is go to the particular vessel and ride it down. Now it wasn't leaving orbit before because its periapsis was in around 50 kilometers which is in the atmosphere of Kerbin but it isn't low enough for Kerbal Space Program to assume that the thing has been destroyed in which case it takes it off the map. So it just rides around on rails. Now that I'm it's the active vessel uh, when I re-enter the atmosphere, um, you know, atmospheric physics, aerodynamics will take over and this thing will experience drag and it will uh, deorbit itself. I think it's a great way to recover these particular vessels and actually have some control over where it's going to land. Now, this thing has no probe bodies. It has nothing on it whatsoever, so I have no control over it. it it's just going to do what it's going to do. Now you had seen me try this uh, once before with the ascent stage from the Curse Stock 5 a couple of episodes ago and that particular attempt failed because the parachutes never deployed and it simply just crashed into the ground or into the water. Um, at that time I made the comment of how wonderfully it was tracking and this just sticking purely to the retrograde vector and how well the aerodynamic model for uh, Kerbal Space Program, the stock aerodynamics, must be so much simpler than mods like FAR and NEAR. Well, aerodynamics is clearly having a lot more fun with this particular vessel. Now, this time the parachutes do deploy. That is not the problem. The problem is instead that they deployed at an altitude of 30 kilometers. Far too high for them to survive the re-entry shock heating and they burned off, and well, that was it. The, the, the conclusion of this now was going to be inevitable. Uh, why did that happen? Well, because I left it obviously set that it was going to deploy at 30 kilometers. I forgot to change it to four kilometers, which is what I normally like to have them deploy at. Um, yeah, that was just an oversight on my part. Had to do with the fact that uh, I had another vessel that I showed a couple of episodes ago where I was showing how to set those uh, pre-deployment altitudes in the vehicle assembly building now that I had um, now that I had uh, uh, action group set up but um, I didn't do it with this particular vessel but I forgot I didn't do it with this vessel well oh well what you gonna do uh, the real kick in the teeth of course is that the ComSat 3 was an identical one to this one so it is destined to suffer the exact same fate, but at the very least, there is some positives in all of this. The parachutes did deploy. I did arm them properly. All I have to do is make sure that they deploy at the right altitude. And that brings us to Muna 1. Now in space for over 33 days and coming in for its third encounter with the moon, except this time, I think I might get something that I'm able to work with. If you take a look at the connection, you can see that the connection, whoop, there it is, is way to the west of Kerbin, which means I have a good few hours of connection there with the KSC uh, guaranteed. In addition, I'm looking at this periapsis and the delta V that I have left. I have about 211 meters per second of delta V left, and I'm looking at this going, I think I can turn this into an encounter. Now, what I decided to, or an encounter, into a collision, remember that Moon 1 um, is supposed to be on a suborbital trajectory with the Moon, at which time I'm supposed to test the ant engine that's on it. That's the contract that this thing has been 
carrying around with it for quite some time. But what I decided to do is I decided, you know, I'm going to quick save. I hope people don't mind if I do this because I don't have maneuver nodes yet, though they are unlocking very, very soon. Um, but so I did a quick save and I thought, you know what, I'm going to burn radially away from Kerbin or radially towards the moon. So I went out here into the full view to get a look at, okay, that's towards Kerbin. So I got to go to the other radial vector. There it is, radially towards the moon. That's the one. And I'm just going to burn and see if I can uh, get myself a collision course, collision trajectory with the moon. Throttle up. What I want to see is I want to see that periapsis disappear. Again, throttle up a bit more. But it started to become pretty apparent here that I wasn't going to get a collision trajectory this way. So I held down F9 and uh, reloaded from that quick save that I just did. Normally I don't like to do this kind of thing, but um, I, don't, I don't have maneuver nodes that I, I really want to get this mission over with. I really want to collide with the moon. So I thought, okay, so just purely radially towards the moon wasn't going to work. So how about if I kind of split the difference between radially in and retrograde. I thought that might make, uh, you know, lower the periapsis more effectively. So there we are, halfway between the two. Throttle up. Again, watching that periapsis. Boom, it's gone. I'm going to collide. Yes, I'm on a collision course with the moon. And now all I have to do is wait for um me to reach the required altitude which is between 10 kilometers and 27 kilometers test the ant engine at that particular altitude and i should be able to finally finish off this contract unfortunately it wasn't meant to be once i opened the contract in the contract plus window i can see that the suborbital trajectory uh, requirement of the contract is not going green um, I suppose, oh, I do get a temperature scan. I just got into low space around Kerbin. So there we go. We can do a temperature scan and send that off. I do have a thermometer on this thing. But the suborbital trajectory, as you can see there on the right, is still white. It hasn't gone green. So I haven't fulfilled that part of the contract. And I suppose this doesn't count as a suborbital trajectory. I guess it's still a hyperbolic trajectory because my apoapsis is out beyond uh, the moon's sphere of influence. So I suppose for it to count as um, suborbital, I have to have a positive apoapsis and a negative periapsis. And that's not what I have here. They're both negative, as you can see, and that's because the apoapsis is outside of the moon's sphere of influence. I'm on a hyperbolic trajectory, not a parabolic trajectory. So this is not counting as suborbital. Um, I decided I'd run the test anyway, just to make sure. And here we are closing in on the required altitude. The altitude indicator is now green. I click to run the test, but the contract does not go green. It does not get completed. This is not suborbital. This mission was actually doomed from the get-go because right from the beginning, my whole plan was just to simply hit the moon. And thought, I thought that would be suborbital. So live and learn. This is not counting as suborbital. All that was left to do was to watch this thing helplessly crash into the moon. It doesn't have... Well, it has no fuel left whatsoever, so there's absolutely nothing I can do except for hopefully enjoy the collision. Hmm. Even that was rather underwhelming. So, nothing left to it. It's time to move on to something, though, perhaps a little bit more dependable. This is Bob. Bob in the science buggy. The science buggy is the same science buggy you saw several episodes ago, except this time it is equipped with the newest of science toys, the barometer that I have now unlocked. And all he's doing is driving around the Kerbal Space Center, going to various biomes around here, and uh, doing pressure scans, as well as squeaking out any, perhaps, uh, uh, materials bay or goo science that he might that might still be lurking around in the corners, trying to squeeze out every last decimal place worth of science. Very, very routine mission. Very, very easy to do. I also took some time to run over to the nearby grasslands and uh, nearby shores. And while I was over there, I ran into another one of these slivers of tundra. And this time, yeah, I, I couldn't resist. I mean, look at all the science here. So I had to scoop that up. And that little runaround mission 
netted me 72.6 science just from that little mission alone, giving me a total of 147 now, which allowed me to unlock another node off the tech tree, and this time I went for advanced flight control. Uh, this gives me some more capsules, gives me some RCS, which is great, reaction control systems for orbital maneuvering, and I think most usefully, it's going to give me the 1.25 meter reaction wheels, which should help me uh, with control with some of my larger rockets once I'm outside of the atmosphere. Then it's Curse Stock 5. Uh, this is the fourth. Well, it's five, but that's because I botched number one. But this will complete the four satellites I need for my phase one communication network, my generation one communication network. Um, you, last episode, I spent a lot of time talking about how to get these guys into orbit, how to position them so that they are the appropriate phase angle apart, and how to use the information that's given to you with the rendezvous computer that comes with Kerbal Engineer. I did have some issues with... Uh, the parachutes so here I am checking to make sure yes that pre-deployment altitude is four kilometers not 30 kilometers that was set in the vehicle assembly building but I got a little bit paranoid and made sure to check it but anyway I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about this other than to show you that after that little bit of checking of the parachutes and making sure that everything was fine I ended up separating that first stage without arming that parachute so <laughs> Parachutes are set correctly and not armed, so yes, this stage is destined to also crash into the surface of Kerb, and I'm not doing very well with these. Otherwise, though, the insertion of this satellite went uh, with no other issues. Alright, all the contract requirements have just gone green, now it's just a matter of waiting for two days and this remote tech contract to set up a Kerbin communication network will finally be complete. But for now, we can take a moment to enjoy the fruits of our labor. We can see here our four satellites in this nice little square with ComSat 1, unfortunately, off there to the right, kind of ruining the symmetry. But we got communication links between all our satellites. They will be in communication with each other all the time, as well as communicating with any satellites that are uh, below this 1,000 kilometer orbit. In addition, there are communication codes heading out to Minmus, heading out to the moon. I have additional antennas that I can use to target any other vo uh, vessels that might be uh, in around the Kerbin sphere of influence. So this pretty much covers the entire Kerbin sphere of influence uh, other than the far sides of the moon and Minmus. In order to get those guys covered, we have to start putting satellites around those bodies, but I'm not at that point yet. So. I think that means that it is time to move on to a new vessel, and that being JunkSat-1, which is all ready to go. It's been built, it's ready to be on the pad, but the launch pad needs to be reconditioned after the launch of ComSat-5, which wasn't that long ago. So that's no problem. It's another hour and 40 minutes of time warping for that, and then we're ready to go. Now the mission is to put a satellite into a very specific orbit. And this orbit is about as bad an orbit as you can get around Kerbin. It's Apoapsis is way out past the moon's orbit, but worse, its inclination is 162.8 degrees. This makes it a retrograde orbit, and retrograde orbits are the hard orbits. They're the expensive orbits to get. I'll talk about that in just a little bit. But the first thing I want to talk about is launch is, is getting into these inclina inclined orbits. When you're putting a vessel into an inclined orbit around Kerbin, save yourself a lot of misery by launching into the appropriate inclination or as close as you can get. Um, I've seen videos of people doing these types of missions and launching you know, first going into an equatorial orbit and then changing the inclination. Don't do that. That's expensive. Inclination changes are expensive orbital maneuver. Do it right from launch. Now, I want an inclination of 162.8 degrees. So the first thing I need to do is determine when is it that I'm going to have to do my launch. And I do that by looking at the ascending and descending nodes of my target orbit, kind of lining them up as you see here, and then zooming out. And what I want to do is I want to launch when the launch site is below one of those two nodes. What really helps is the moon's orbit. The moon's orbit has an inclination of zero. So you can kind of create sort of this crosshair between your target orbit and the moon's orbit, and then just time warp 
and it actually helps to actually select Kerbin as your target while you're doing this. It makes it more accurate. And then time warp until your launch site is right into those crosshairs. And I can see from this that I need to launch to the north, right? Uh, remember this orbit is going backwards, so that's a little bit awkward. I got to launch to the north. And 162.8 degree inclination is 17.2 degrees from 180 degrees, which is straight out retrograde. So that means I got to be 17.2 degrees to the north of west. West is 270 degrees as far as the heading goes. So you add on the 17.2. That means I need to head off into an eventual heading of 287.2 degrees. Okay, so let's talk about these retrograde orbits and why they're so expensive. Actually, the real reason is understanding why going in a prograde direction is less expensive. And, and the main reason is, is you got to remember that Kerbin is rotating, right? Kerbin is rotating, and at the equator, the surface velocity of its rotation is about 175 meters per second. And Kerbal Space Center is located pretty much right on the equator. So that means when you launch in a prograde direction, you're already moving at 175 meters per second just sitting on the ground. And the whole idea of achieving an orbit, of course, is to get orbital velocity, which is in around 2.25 kilometers per second or so. So you get that 175 meters per second for free if you go in a prograde direction, which is towards the east. However, when you want to launch in a retrograde direction towards the west, like I am doing here, well, now that 175 meters per second is working against you. So you have to still get to that 2.25 kilometers per second or so, but you have to first negate that 175 meters per second that you are moving in the wrong direction. And then you've got to add on another 175 meters per second uh, just to get to what you would have had if you were going in a prograde direction. So already in the hole, you're already in the hole before you've even left the ground you're in the hole 350 meters per second, right? So you're going to be spending more on your ascents. That's why this particular ascent stage, that's the first stage and the boosters, had a delta V of 3,856 meters per second, which is about 400 meters per second more than what I would typically use if I launched into a prograde direction. To be honest, that's probably a little optimistic. Um, the reason why it's optimistic is number one, I'm flying this by hand as you can see here. I'm not using my normal KOS script. That's because my KOS script goes all buggy when I go retrograde. Uh, I could probably get into the code and try and figure out why it goes all squ squirrely when, when I try to go retrograde. It, it, cannot, it, does, it doesn't know what direction to go when I try to do that. Um, but to be honest, I enjoy playing Kerbal Space Program more than I enjoy coding in Kerbal Space Program. So. I don't do that. <laughs> uh, and the second, though, so because I'm going by hand and because I'm going into kind of a stupid direction, you know that my ascent is not going to be as efficient as it otherwise can be. So we've activated that communitron. Make sure to arm the parachutes after the fiasco of the last few ascents. I'm going to make sure that this, these are nice and armed and they're... Uh, then check the info and make sure that the pre-deployment altitude is correct. Yes, four kilometers, that's all right. So that's good. It's so nice actually doing these launches and not having to worry about communication because uh, I know now no matter what, uh, that communitron will be able to communicate with one of the commsats that's up there in orbit. Anyway, um, I'm not too concerned about the efficiency of my ascent because I put a lot of delta V into the satellite itself. The satellite has 1,692 meters per second of delta V, which is enough to do a home in transfer to get out to the um, orbit that I need, and additional delta V, and so there's enough there to actually deorbit it again, so I can try and keep my uh, skies clean. But uh, the deorbit part's not part of the contract, so if that ends up not working, if, I, if my ascent is less efficient than I would have liked, well, if I lose a little bit from the uh, satellite, that's not a big deal. I'll still be able to complete the uh, mission without any issues. Oh, and there are my lights. I'd forgotten I put lights on this thing. I don't know about you, but blue, always the way to go. <laughs> <All right? laughs> I think it's just years of, of PCs. I've never actually lit my PC up in blue, but every time I see somebody else's PC lit up in blue or blue lights under their cars or whatever it is, oh, yes, it's probably a little ostentatious and a little bit geeky and nerdy, but uh, I don't know, it was a video game. We're allowed to be geeky and nerdy. 
periapsis getting to oh it's into the positive 16 kilometer periapsis before i ran out of fuel on that first stage that that ain't so bad i kind of i'm all right with that and then it was just a simple matter of circularizing this and planning my transfer out to the orbit that i want okay so let's go out to map view here and see how this turned out so there's my orbit in blue my target in i guess almost blue too like teal that's pretty good the inclinations are very very close so what i like to do is I now have maneuver nodes since I've had the tracking station just upgraded and so I'm going to use a maneuver node to plan a maneuver and I like to burn out to either the apoapsis or the periapsis of my target orbit and you can see as soon as I create a maneuver node here I get this new window popping up and this is precise node I'm a big fan of this mod I, I don't even think I could play I would play this game without this mod I, uh, I find dragging the little sliders around on the maneuver nodes quite maddening um, and precise node gives you very precise controls of of your burn. Um, you write write down as much. We can enter in numbers if you wanted to. Um, I'm noticing here that I am getting uh, a moon encounter, and uh, yeah, the moon encounter is before I get out to Apoapsis. So so okay. So I'm not going to go this way because the moon's going to mess me up. So instead. I'll go for the periapsis, so I'm just going to set it so that the apoapsis of my burn ends up at uh, near the desired periapsis. And to be honest, I like to put it a little bit ahead of the periapsis, because usually I find when I go to do my circularization, I end up uh, pushing the periapsis or the apoapsis forward. So uh, I like to end, put it a little bit ahead so that uh, hopefully my eventual periapsis will be very, very close to uh where it's supposed to be now i can see here that my orbit's coming out a little bit above uh my target orbit so i i can that's going to necessitate an inclination change but now is not the time to do that you do not want to do that while you're close to curve and inclination change or changes are much more efficient the further out you are from curbin uh because your velocity is lower whenever you're burning in a direction that is perpendicular to that prograde retrograde direction you want to do it while you are going slow um and uh that, so i'm going to make that inclination change well out from curbing so all that's left to do now is to just time warp uh to the point to our maneuver and it was while i was in the process of time warping that this message came up that the first stage ended up being destroyed ah oh, there we go Twelve thousand five hundred her bucks down the drain and yes it was traveling too fast in the atmosphere burned up i i think i know what the issue is with all of this um it has to do with real shoot and stage recovery not quite getting along with real shoot if i deploy the parachutes while in a vacuum real shoots will say you cannot deploy parachutes in a vacuum you have to arm them but i think stage recovery when it sees parachute, they don't know. It doesn't know what armed parachute means. It's just looking for deployed parachutes, and it just sees that they're not deployed. So it goes, "Oh well, you're not going to survive this, are you?" And then it says that the parachute. So I don't know. Those two just aren't quite getting along. Anyway, we're getting ready for our burn. This is just a simple matter of burning until our apoapsis gets up to where our eventual periapsis needs to be, which is in around uh, 10,800, what, 484 kilometers, sorry. Um, and to be honest, as I'm doing this burn, I'm actually paying more attention to Kerbal Engineer and where my apoapsis height is rather than paying attention to the uh, maneuver node burn indicator that's over there next to the nav ball unfortunately right at the end there i ended up getting my fingers mixed up and pressed z to go to max thrust rather than x to cut thrust so i ended up over burning and i have to burn a little bit retrograde to kind of fix this up but no matter and then it came time to set up my maneuver for my inclination change now what i like to do is put a maneuver node out here pretty much just at random just getting a little bit mixed up as to which way around i'm going yes it's this way <laughs> <laughs> stupid retrograde anyway and i'll put it out here at random and i'm going to i'm going to need to burn uh i can see a little bit towards the south but again i got a little mixed up as to south is normally negative when you're going prograde but uh, south is now positive normal because i'm going retrograde so that's a little confusing but anyway give myself a little bit of normal and then i grab it and i just move it around and i'm watching 
what effect that has on my apple axis location trying to find the spot that affects that inclination change the most so i think i got the spot pretty close here it's not that time sensitive to be quite honest and then it's just a matter of pushing it down till it looks about right that looks pretty good to me and then what we're going to do is we're going to use alarm clock to set up a uh, an alarm for us for this maneuver the maneuver is going to be in about an hour and a half so we just need to go to alarm clock press the button it set up the maneuver we can now safely just time warp and alarm clock will cut the time warp and uh and give us a notification that we are ready for our maneuver. Now, one thing I do have to be careful about out here is communication. I am well out of range of the communitrons. So I have a dish antenna on this satellite that's pointing specifically to one of the commsats. And then I just uh, switched over to that particular commsat and opened or pointed its spare antenna at junksat1, uh, picking a commsat that I knew would have a communication link, wouldn't end up going to the far side of Kerbin anytime soon. And uh, that gave me a strong enough link to be able to uh, fix my inclination. And then it was on my way out towards Apoapsis to perform my final circularization that I got this final note or this notification that said that that. Uh, the remote track tech contract is now complete. So that's another 200,000 curb bucks into the coffers. So we're doing our final burn way out here. A nice view of Kerbin and the moon. Just waiting for our contract requirements to go green. There they go. Now all we have to do is maintain stability for 10 seconds, which is simply a matter of turning off the SAS and just waiting. <laughs> I'm not even 100% sure why that's even there. And there we go, contract complete. And that not only completes this contract, but will complete this episode. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.